Hi, I'm Emily Gong, and this is Beyond Codes and Aesthetics, a podcast series of Art Focus Spoken, where we feature the voices of international artists, curators, and scientists in exploring innovative possibilities that engage with society through art and science. On today's episode, we are excited to speak with postdoctoral fellows both from York University in Toronto, Michael and Cheyenne. Michael is currently using VR to study the relationship between the 3D space depicted on a screen and the space that an observer is in. He wants to use the findings of this line of research to improve existing telecommunication technology and provide an increasing sense of presence when interacting with digital contents on the screen. Cheyenne's goal is to understand the computational mechanisms that underline human vision. His approach tests modern machine vision and graphics algorithms as models of human behavior. Apart from elucidate, elucidating uh, bio, biological vision, his work has the potential to improve computer vision applications. So thank you both so much for being here today. Um, how are you both doing? Uh, it's a great honor. I'm doing good. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty good, thanks. <laughs> nice. Yeah. How has these months been for you guys? So for me, it's been a little bit weird. Um, I really like having my colleagues around to talk to and bounce ideas off of. And you can sort of get by with that on Zoom, but it's not quite the same. But when it comes to actually doing work, I'm pretty independent of the lab. So uh, I've been doing okay on that. Mm-hmm. What about you? It's been fun for me because uh, I get to uh, learn a lot of things on the side because things are not that fast mm-hmm. anymore, So, um, which has been really rewarding for me. Okay. Nice. Yeah, I was going to say it's so nice not to have to speak to you guys over the screen. Of the yeah, screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, what a change. And mm-hmm. well, I think that was all like adaptations. I guess now you guys do a lot of like online work, right? I don't know if you guys teach at all or is it just mainly research focus? So I'm only doing research right now. Uh-huh. Uh, it would be nice to teach, but um, the postdocs typically don't teach at York, uh, as far as I know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't teach either, but uh, I do have a couple of master's students uh, working with me and then uh, been uh, doing some mentorship in terms of uh, teaching them how to do research. Nice. And so, could you lay the groundwork a little bit about like key concepts of your research? Um, and especially for audience that maybe not have like a science background too. Yeah, so um, my research, the ultimate goal of my research is to understand how the mind and the brain work. And specifically, I focus on perception, and within perception, I focus on vision. So do you want me to just sort of go through my my main research questions? Okay. So what I'd like to understand is what are the computations that underlie human vision? So if we wanted to program a computer to see like a human sees, what would we program that computer to do? And what I've recently been doing is to try to compare recent advances in computer vision to human vision. Now, what does that mean? So computer vision is basically the art or the science of taking a computer and programming it somehow so that it can do tasks with visual input. So for example, things that you might have experience with are face detection algorithms. If you point your phone at someone, it puts a little box around their face, right? That's a visual task that the computer's doing. More, mo- more modern applications are things like self-driving cars or, um, for example, Google image search. And it's, the field of computer vision has changed a lot in the last 15 or so years. Mm-hmm. And wh- one main way that it's changed is we've moved from algorithms which are designed from the ground up So the programmer puts in exactly what they want the computer to do. Whereas now they're moving more towards learning based algorithms. So rather than say, okay, computer, if you see this thing in the image, say it's a face, uh, instead you show it many, many examples of faces and it learns through some um, sort of feedback what a face looks like. Uh, And Since these algorithms have come about, a lot of people have wondered, well, are they working in their insides the same way that the human brain works? And so my work has been trying to take these algorithms, sort of dissect them as you would a human, uh, well, you wouldn't dissect a human brain, but maybe look inside a human brain and try to figure out 
what's going on in the algorithm and is it sort of like what's going on in human vision? And the way I approach that is by uh, sh comparing how humans and these algorithms respond to different types of images uh, and doing sort of like mathematical and modeling on those, um, on those inputs and outputs. So it sounds like it's also quite like machine learning heavy then? So mm. a little bit, yeah. I would say that my work doesn't, is it, so part of my work with a student is trying to improve machine learning, mm. uh, but most of my work is trying to understand how humans actually work mm. and using computers as a model mm -hmm. for how humans might work. And then how did you come across this field of research? Uh, I've always been interested in how the brain and the mind work. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's a very natural thing to wonder about. Um, we only know the world through our brains. Uh, and I feel like if we can understand how we perceive the world, we can better understand, you know, how the world works and uh, why we are the way we are. And um, so... I got sort of into vision when I was in college uh, because I was really enthralled by these visual illusions. I'm sure you've seen things like these before. Uh, but, uh, for example, you might have some a checkerboard uh, and you see these little dots at the intersections which aren't actually there. Or uh, one cool thing to note is that every human or every person's eye has a blind spot. Uh -huh. And what your brain does is it sort of guesses what should be in there. And these sort of weird things about vision really led me to want to study them. And I have a background in physics as well, and I thought, well, why don't we apply the quantitative methods that we have honed in technical fields like physics uh, and computer science to understanding how the mind works. And so naturally, with the advent of, you know, really powerful machine learning, I thought, well, this could be a good way to model how the mind works. Vision in particular. Very cool. Yeah, how about you? For um, I've been studying uh, human visual perception for quite a bit. Um, what I've been doing mostly was uh, related to uh, stereo vision. Uh, in particular, what stereo vision is, is that, uh, you know, if you've been to a 3D movie before, then uh, things just pop out, pop out of you because uh, our eyes are separated by a certain distance, so they form slightly different images, and then we fuse those images together uh -huh. to produce like, this kind of like a, what they call 3D effect. Right. So uh, essentially, it's just uh, help us to recover the depth structure of a 3D object in the everyday world. And uh, so I use uh, computer graphics to as a tool to um, to present stimuli to people and then ask them to do various tasks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, so currently, I'm using a VR to do something similar, which is to study uh, the the different 3D spaces there are. So for instance, we were looking at a computer monitor during the Zoom meeting, for instance. Um, you see your counterpart as a flat being displayed on a flat surface, right? But then that, that your counterpart is in a 3D space, what we call a pictorial space. And then you uh, yourself, on the other hand, is in another physical space called a visual space. So you have direct contact with the physical space, the 3D space that you're in. But then you're completely cut off from the pictorial space, the 3D space that your counterpart is in. So there's this intrinsic disconnect, which was hypothesized would be the cause for what we call a Zoom fatigue, right? You must have seen it on the news quite a lot, <laughs> right? So, uh, so I'm trying to, uh, trying to understand like what causes this disconnect and through what way can we reconnect the two different spaces together so that it will improve uh, people's uh, experience using um, computer monitors, for instance, and then uh, also present a sense of presence, mm. which essentially means that you are sharing the same space as whatever is being presented onto the computer monitor. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, that's it. That's so cool. And so how did you come across this initially? Um, my supervisor does that, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. but I think it's a cool idea because uh, this kind of idea it has a long tradition. I think uh -huh. back in the Renaissance period, uh -huh. there's a guy called Alberti, uh -huh. and then uh, he he has this like pinhole thing, right? Right. So so like you have a scene that go through the pinhole, and then he has like canvas, and he just like trace the contours of the objects to create the perfect linear perspective, by right? create recreating the three D space that's through the pinhole. That's what the modern day camera is about, right? So, uh, so I think this this line of thinking to be able to recreate this sort of realism, 
has been there all along, but now we want to take it up a notch. So more than taking through the realism, but it's more about this experience of being present in that depicted 3D space that that people through review through a, like a pinhole camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating, and so I come from an arts background, um, and I think what you guys both touched on with like perception and vision is really fascinating. But I think you guys approach it from a different perspective, and you guys both mentioned kind of a blind spot, and so like, can we elaborate a little bit there? Uh, yeah. So um, I was talking tech, like a very technical blind spot. Like right. uh, there's oh. literally a part of your visual field that if you only look with one eye. There, you can't see anything there. Uh, and uh, I guess he's talking more like, yeah, maybe you can explain what you mean by blind spot. Did I say blind spot? No. Or I guess <laughs> like part of the um, scene where it's like different from what you... Oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. Because like, think about it. Like in real life, uh -huh. if I'm looking at you, right, right, and then I move, I'll be able to see different parts of you that's being previously occluded. Right. Right, because if I move, I have a different perspective of you. Uh -huh. But think about it in terms of a camera, right? So what you see, you're, you're in your counterpart when you're doing a Zoom meeting, you see your counterpart through the camera of your counterpart. Part, right. right. So even if you move, it doesn't mean that the camera through which that you see your counterpart with moves with you. So it's static. Right. So that means it doesn't matter how you move, you still see the same part of your your conversation of partner or counterpart's face. So there's lack of this, what we call a sensory motor contingencies. Uh -huh. That's like, uh, that that's manifest through this uh, computer displays and then Zoom meetings, for instance. Right. And then that's kind of makes this, creates this kind of a disconnect between mm -hmm. you and whatever is being displayed on this computer screen. Right, so part of the Zoom fatigue too is because there's a disturbance from the actual, like, reality is if we're talking because mm -hmm. there's more i guess limitations mm -hmm. in terms of visual space mm -hmm. yes uh, in terms of the technological equipments that we use uh -huh. so um, you can think of it this way it's like uh, like metaphysically it's more like we are intrinsically separated uh -huh. and the gap between us is created by what we call computer right or digital technology uh -huh. And then we're trying to bridge this gap. I mean, of course, one way to get rid of this is to stop using computers and then just start hanging out with people in real life. But <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult to do it in COVID time. So, so yeah. yeah, but also in the future, you can imagine if we have really good internet and we have really good systems, mm -hmm. virtual reality will do most of our meetings virtually. Right, right. right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. What do you guys like think about like the future of this? The future of like virtual interactions? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't actually, I don't have a great um, prediction about what will happen. Uh, it's entirely possible that, you know, instead of going to your office, you go to a room and you put on a virtual headset and mm -hmm. that's where you do all of your work on a day to day basis. Uh, it's also possible that that will never catch on. So I, I don't really don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it will. Though. I think more and more workplaces will just be virtual workplaces. Because if you think about it, you can be a lot more efficient. If you don't have to drive to work, you don't have to dress up, you don't have to, um, you know, spend all this time getting ready to go to work. And then once you get there, you're limited to a screen anyways, right? So what's the point? And if you had good interactions like uh, Michael's trying to mm -hmm. develop, then you could feel like you're in your office, even though you're just in your room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think, I guess... It'll things will move towards that direction. I don't know if everybody's work will become like that, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, the the abstract trend in art, uh -huh. where you know, I, since uh, based on my understanding is that since the the invention of camera, like like cameras, right, and then people just start to steer away from realism, right. where they 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 go into more abstractive. 
ab abstract artworks like uh, Picasso's or you know with a more extreme form like such as um, um, the guy with splatters paints all over the place you know. Jackson Pollock yes that's him <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, so I think so so currently we're trying to go mm -hmm. through the same trend right mm -hmm. because now we are limited by the digital technology that we have mm -hmm. so, so think about it if we did in if we do indeed arrive at a stage where face-to-face -face interactions become obsolete because people can just interact with others in the comfort of their home yeah. without having to step out ever again. Like, what would the art be, right? And then like, what would be a response to this trend? P me personally, I don't really like it. It's, it sucks because, <laughs> <laughs> because who, who wanted to interact with uh, virtual characters? Or even if just granted that uh, the realism can be like tremendous, like I can see like a like a like a real you. But I still wouldn't prefer. I still prefer like a face-to-face -face meeting, even though digital technology can completely recreate this kind of realism that we have in real life. Mm -hmm. I'm curious then, like, what are key things that are hindering that? Um, I guess like more VR usage. Like for instance, a lot of um, art shows have taken online mm -hmm. and then a lot of fairs now like for the incoming uh, biennales of 2021 and 2022 they've already said that as long as you have a vr headset you can participate because you can just view but who has access to a vr <laughs> headset too um like i'm just curious but then from a technical standpoint what are key challenges to make it i guess more of a presence or more of a realistic experience mm. i think you should answer this one uh, it's. I think it's like if you if you have been using a headset before, oh. you can see like how bulky it is and how <laughs> awkward it is just being placed onto your face. It's tiring after a while. Yeah, for your neck too. Like, right. Exactly. Yeah. And also, it completely cuts you off from your surrounding environment. Right. Yeah, that's true. Right. Even though you can like put on like a like a, the cameras in front of the the headset that you let you see through where you're in where you're in, but but then it's it kind of harms the 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 realism that's being produced with the VR headset, so that's why I think uh, like technologically, AR augmented reality has been picking up pace, because it has the um, the benefit of using a headset which will create a three D virtual objects in your surroundings, but that then does not cut, completely cut you off from your surroundings. I think um, like uh, Microsoft has a is it Microsoft? Yeah, uh, yeah. Hololens. A uh, Hololens too, right? Mm -hmm. Those. That's pretty cool. And then people have been using that to um, to to try to figure out different ways to input to 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 use this tool to like, for instance, with a virtual conference, you can see the virtual character of your your conversation partner com, partner. Yeah. And, stuff. and then uh, also like virtual meetings and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, but I still think VR technology and AR technology has so long to go, right? Yeah. Um, you've used the VR headset before, I assume, right? Mm -hmm. You can see the pixels, right? You can see the dividing uh, lines where the different rows of pixels are. So we don't have the cap capability for various reasons to show a screen that looks indistinguishable from reality, just based on resolution alone. Uh, furthermore, like when you move your head and you move your eyes, um, you can get artifacts where um, you see things that aren't there, or um, the thing doesn't catch up with your head as quickly, although they're getting better at that. Um, there are a lot of technical hurdles to get over, I think, as well, just purely based on, just purely like, how well can they recreate the, the, the real world. Mm -hmm. And also, you, maybe you can talk about this better than I can, but in the real world, when things are different distances, you, the lens in your eye changes shape to focus at different mm -hmm. distances. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you know this from an art perspective, like if you draw something, it should be fo might be focused here and not focused in the back if you want it to look photorealistic. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that with current head-mounted displays because they display everything on a two-dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's there's a lot of things that, and people are working on it but mm -hmm. it's just not there yet yeah. Mm -hmm. right yeah I, and i think for especially for art that's so weird that they want to do vr because mm -hmm. you really don't want to mess up art right <laughs> it's okay if you're at a virtual conference mm -hmm. and right. the avatar looks crappy <laughs> or you're you know you're virtually surfing or something like that you don't need to see the individual wavelet like 
tips. But if you're looking at art, it needs to look like it does in real life, right? Otherwise, like, what's the point? Have you had any experience with that? Not with art, no. Okay. I, I definitely worn VR headsets and played around with them. And yeah. it's funny because they're actually pretty good at rendering game type stuff. Uh -huh. Things that, you know, where the exact surfaces don't matter very much. Just yeah. sort of like there's a table and it's the right shape and has the right sort of texture. But the details, it doesn't do very well. Mm -hmm. And that's what... You know, you can't have art without details. I don't know. I'm not an artist. No, I wonder, like, if details is actually necessary or is more about the experience. Well, think about if you wanted to view a Pollock in, um, in VR, right? Mm -hmm. you, you might not be able to see the splotches. Right. So what would be the point? That's right? true. Uh, uh, you'd have to stick your face up to it this close so uh -huh. that... The pixels can actually render that. Uh -huh. This watch is different. So right. That's that's just what I mean. A very basic sense. Right. Yeah. But I remember that I was in um an, like at an art show. I think this was four years back, and there was a VR one, and it was like kind of like creatures from your subconscious, and then mm -hmm. you would sit on this like makeshift creature thing, and I remember putting on the headset. And somehow I fell through the creature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it, that wasn't supposed to happen, right? No, it right? wasn't yeah. supposed to happen, and it was like, yeah, super like disorienting. Yeah. And I could see the pixels, of course. Or you would run to like because you're following one of the creatures, and you would fall off the edge. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so I guess that's the initial stage. I guess it, maybe it was actually further back than four years ago. Yeah. However, I have played some really, really realistic uh, first shooter yeah. games where like the scene is just so real yeah and yeah. it's like super immersive yeah but i i don't know like what well they put yeah. like you know millions of dollars into developing exactly, those games right yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'm not yeah you know more about programming in vr than i do it, just, mm -hmm. it seems like it's it's pretty hard to do it right to it's, program a realistic vr scene oh realistic i think uh, again it, it goes back to my earlier comment which is uh, whether it's necessary to make things look realistic I, I i'm wondering if you have seen the movie a ready player one yeah so so in their virtual world everybody has their own avatars mm -hmm. but then the virtual world is not exactly the same as the real world it's still like those like cartoonish kind of a 3d models of the real world right but then but then people are fully immersed in it yeah. because not only they have uh, like uh, as they move, they see differently. They also have this like, kind of treadmill where they can just walk on in any direction uh -huh. as if they're actually walking. And they also have this haptic suits. So if somebody pinch you and then in the game, then yeah. you feel the pinch in real life. Whoa. So and then so so those things like think can kind of enhance the experience to the extent that the world doesn't need to look real anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, it kind of blurs the line between what is real and then what is not real, right? right? Because it could be well possible that that world is real. Uh -huh. And then as long as all the physics and everything else works the same as the world that you know is real works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's hard to do. Right. Yes, yes, that is screwing me up. Although there are like a lot of technologies like that producing haptic suits or you know omnidirectional treadmills that yeah. we can move around in yeah, yeah. all directions, and but uh, they're all seem kind of little. And I would think like from like for instance a programming perspective, and I guess this goes for both of you guys too. Is like for instance when you're improving like the computer vision, mm -hmm. um, and like but based on human vision, mm -hmm. or if you're trying to program it so that it looks. Re more realistic to humans like experience in virtual reality mm -hmm. like i guess what are like key challenges and like what is that like process like i guess Ooh. so trying to improve computer vision is a so the computer vision as a whole, and again, I'm not a computer vision person. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a human vision yeah, person. Yeah, but for human but, vision, for instance, yeah, like yeah. how would you go about like thinking these and... How would I think about... Um, Human vision or computer vision? I guess um, human vision, but then how it underlines, like, or what are the, what's the relationship, for instance, because I don't even really know, like, yeah. and how you go about doing this. So there, there's no necessary connection. We mm -hmm. could build a computer vision system that, that works nothing like the human vision system, and it would probably work to some extent. 
but practically, we do take insights, a few insights from human vision, and apply them to computer vision. So one that one algorithm that's super popular right now are called uh, deep neural networks or deep learning. Uh, these are extensions of what were called artificial neural networks, which were developed a long time ago, like in the 80s and earlier. And <clears throat> these were loosely based on how the brain works. So they have a very sort of, a, we call it a toy model, but you can think of it as a very super simplified version of how a neuron in the brain works. So neurons are the basic building blocks of the brain. Mm -hmm. And they connected a bunch of these artificial neurons up and they found that they could do some simple tasks if you train them. Uh, so for example, identifying what digit uh, is on the screen, uh, which is useful for things like sorting mail, for example. But they didn't have much traction because computers basically weren't there and the learning algorithms weren't well developed. <coughs> Although that's not entirely true. But for whatever reason, in 2011, 2012, there was a huge explosion in the field of research because these things started to actually work, right? So there is that very loose connection. Um, and there are plenty of people who are trying to mine the brain for insights uh, on how to develop computer vision algorithms. Uh, so another uh, sort of way that we think the brain works is that neurons basically measure little, uh, well, we could call them like feature detectors, but what that means is that neurons really like to look for specific things in an image. So one neuron really might like to see an edge between the light and a dark spot, right? Or one neuron really might like to see green next to red or something like that. And these feature detectors are, we think, the building blocks of how vision works. Uh, and also, whenever you train these neural networks, it seems like they also pick up on those similar sorts of feature detectors. So just by chance, in a sense, we ended up finding things that look like how the brain works in these uh, artificial neural networks. So there is a link there. And then there, you know, I, I'm not doing the field justice at all. There's lots of people that have legitimately tried to like take concepts from the brain and directly build computer vision algorithms from them too. It's just that this is the most popular thing right now. Yeah, uh, there's yeah, there, there's a lot of a lot of stuff. There are a lot of connections, but it doesn't have to be the case, right? We just it just so happens, and people try to make it the case that we build computer vision to work like human vision. Yeah, and I wonder too, like because human vision, there's also areas where it's flawed. Yeah. So then that would be, but then that would not be the one that's fed into the yeah. yeah. So you can <laughs> so think selective. Yeah, so you can think, like, what's a very simple w way to, to, to describe that, right? Like, our vision only works from here forward, right? We mm -hmm. can't see behind our heads. Mm -hmm. But you could build a computer vision algorithm that sees 360 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. um, our eyes have to close every once in a while so that we lubricate our eyes with, with uh, like, tear uh, fluid, right? Mm -hmm. Computers don't need to blink, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, there are lots of very simple things, and then there are higher level things. But in the end, the human vision system is way more powerful than any computer vision system that we've built so mm -hmm. far in terms of flexibility, uh, in terms of generalization, in terms of many, many different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we, you couldn't have a computer vi vision algorithm that runs a humanoid robot right now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So how do you know like a uh, computer vision is the same as the human vision? I don't know. It's not. <laughs> right. Because because like I was just thinking about it like there are several ways that you can measure that. Like first yeah. it's based on the task outcome. Yeah. Like how how effectively both systems perform a single task. Yeah. Right? And then and then based on that you cannot just say two systems are equivalent. You can you, you can? No, you can't. You can't. Yeah, you cannot, right? No. And then uh, alternatively like you can also analyze the structures of the systems, but then the computer vision structure is just the way we design it to be. Whereas, like human visual, like neural system, is like yeah, it's unfathomable. It's like yeah, <laughs> so big. So I would argue that we didn't design it. so for learning based algorithms. They're not designed right. Right. They're only sort of basic, barely designed. Mm -hmm. 
so I think looking at those and looking to see what they learn is a little, there's something interesting there. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I wouldn't work on it if I didn't think there was something interesting mm -hmm. there. But I agree with you. Just comparing behavior is probably not enough. Right. You have to do something more. I also think, though, that just looking into the algorithms functioning is not enough either. Mm -hmm. Because you can, you can perfectly emulate the visual system in a program, but it might not work. Right. right? So, yeah. And then for the visual system, like how do you go about, I guess, like how do you go about developing that in line with, is it in line with human vision? And are there concepts, I guess, from outside, like in the arts related that you would um, consult to do this? Yeah, so there's, um, maybe you should answer, for, or, or I guess this is the question, <laughs> that you can't answer that. Oh, yeah. uh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, let me think. For and I think yeah. that because I'm speaking very generally, because I'm not really sure like yeah. how it works. Yeah, no, that's so fine. It's, I'm gonna, so it's more like exploring more general. Um, yeah, I I think art is really cool because artists essentially have to learn how to undo all of the stuff that your visual system does when looking at a scene or something, right? So you have this three dimensional world that gets projected onto your retina, which is a two-dimensional surface, and then there's a lot of processing that goes on. For example, if I ask you where the shadows in the room are right now, you wouldn't be able to point to them, right? But they're all in, there are shadows everywhere, and when you see them, you're like, okay, that's fine, that makes sense, it's there. But artists don't get that for free. They have to paint in the shadows, so they have to think about, is this thing going to cast a shadow? If it is casting a shadow, should I put it here, should I put it there? Um, Another, so that's one example. A huge one is color constancy. I'm sure you're familiar with color constancy. Uh, from a visual perspective, you see the same color on an object under, and it, uh, an object looks to be the same color under huge changes in lighting, right? Uh, and if you're painting, what I, what, from what I understand is what you surround a color with affects what, how you see that particular color. If I paint something really red, but everything around it is sort of yellow, that might bias your perception of that color red. And artists have to learn this. They either have to explicitly learn this through courses and through teaching, or they have to intuitively learn this, right? And they have to counteract these things that we, our visual system does to make sense of the world. Um, so yeah, as a graduate student, uh, my advisor would often take us to art exhibits just so that we could like sort of appreciate how hard it is to create something that either looks real or just makes sense at all. Yeah. And like, what are some examples, I guess? Of... Yeah. So there's, uh, I actually have a book right behind you. It's called the visual world of shadows. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. You can pull it out right yeah. there. Yeah. It's uh, by a cool guy named Patrick Shavanaugh. Kavanaugh. Oh. But one of the things he talks about in here is how in art, um, shadows are often inconsistent mm -hmm. and for example here there's I, I guess the camera can't really see it but you can put up a picture later if you want <laughs> but there are these this dog right and he's got these these are supposed to be shadows right they don't yeah. look like shadows they look like extensions of his feet or something like that right so drawing shadows is very hard and getting them to look right but what's interesting as well is when they're not correct you often don't notice so here is a scene uh, where the feet are all casting shadows, right? Mm -hmm. And the artist has drawn them all pointing in wacky directions. Yeah. <laughs> but what's interesting is that if you look at this and you don't know to look for this, you won't notice it, actually. Yeah. They have a lot of tolerance towards um, misdrawn or physically impossible shadows. Uh -huh. uh, and that is something interesting that I'm actually working on as well uh -huh. to try to understand uh, or try to find out where in the brain shadows are represented or whether where they're computed or where they're not computed. Where do shadows disappear in the brain? Because at some point, you're no longer aware of what's going on with the shadows. So maybe that's one example in art where, you know, if you understand the shadows, that's great. If you don't understand them, you can also sort of get away with it. Uh, you know, people often use it to create a sense of distance. Um, or if you have no shadows, there's a particular style. I guess this one does have some shadows, but they don't really make any sense. And then, like, what is your study of shadows now? Uh, I'm working on it still, but what, um, <clears throat> what 
so I'm working with this guy, Patrick Cavanaugh, as well as uh, a few, a couple other people at York, Russ Freud and James Elder. And we know that your brain sees shadows because you see them, right? You can point at them. You can say there's a shadow there. But it's not, you don't think about them. They don't directly impact what you say. They just sort of disappear into the background. And we want to know how does that happen in the brain? Um, where does it happen in the brain? Does it happen early in vision? Does it happen late in vision? Does it happen more cognitively? So we're using fMRI and um, some statistical analyses to try to figure that out. MRI. Yeah, yeah MRI. It's a big, fancy, expensive machine. Yes. Uh -huh. But then is that to see like in the brain what parts are processed when? Yeah, so it's early stages of the research, but what we're trying to do is we are trying to show, well, what we do is we show people images that either contain shadows or don't, but the way that we create the shadows is a very subtle way. We change very little part of the image mm -hmm. and it goes from having no shadows to having shadows. and. What we're hoping to see is a big change in the brain when the thing switches from looking from like it has no shadows to having shadows, despite the image itself not changing very much. Uh, it's uh, yeah, I, I, I should I haven't rehearsed this before, so I don't really I don't have a good uh, way to explain it. But I think those things are pretty hard because in real life we don't think about these things mm -hmm. when we go about life. We're not like extremely conscious. We'd be just thinking, oh yeah, it's a sunny day and the, there's a tree and then, oh, maybe there's a shadow. But mm -hmm. then it's not like things that we were really, I guess, noticing Yeah. until mm -hmm. I guess it's like things that you're working on. Or Michael, when you mentioned that mm -hmm. the idea of capturing the feeling of presence yeah. in yeah. your work. Yeah. Um, and then do you feel that you've become like more conscious of like visualizing things or like how it has that kind of ch changed how you think about things no um no sorry i was just thinking about his shadow thing <laughs> because, because well, i guess like if i can follow up on yeah, that yeah, a little of bit course. Yeah. i mean my question would be why would shadow has a special position in this line of research like why do we specifically perceive shadows for instance gravity is all over us right yeah and then we don't perceive gravity we perceive the consequences of having this constant gravity, 9.8 with whatever unit it is. <laughs> and, right? Because if a ball falls over, the projectile movements, that's the product of gravity, uh -huh. right? Same thing with, uh, with shadows, like in my opinion, it's like we have light. Mm -hmm. Light is like a constant thing that always happens. And we have occlusions. Yeah. We have uh, not like uh, all opaque surfaces that yeah. that stops the light. Yeah. So can shadow just be us perceiving light or the lack of thereof at a certain locations and then that Yeah, so you know this is I mean? this is a good this is a like the philosophical question of right. do is a shadow a thing that we perceive? Like is it an object? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um and I don't, you know, Philosophers will probably debate that question, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would say I don't really have a strong opinion on that as okay. a scientist. Right. It's fun to think about. Right. right? Um, I think if, for example, if you were to have a scene, a picture, mm -hmm. which was blank except there was sort of a fuzzy shadow of something, mm -hmm. I said, "What's in this picture?" You would point to it and say, "There's a shadow." Mm -hmm. right? right. You wouldn't say there's a blockage of light. Right. Or you wouldn't say that there's an object behind me. Mm -hmm. You would say that there's a shadow. Right. So in that linguistic sense, mm -hmm. uh, I think you can, you know, just for the purposes of discussion, call shadows things. Right. And we know that they affect perception. Right. Right. right? Definitely. This shadow on this book tells you that this boat is floating. Right. Mm -hmm. It didn't yeah. just happen to. Mm -hmm. right, 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 right. So I think that's all we need mm -hmm. to, in yeah. order to think that they're worth studying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think shadows is interesting from like our history depictions because in realism you have the shadow put in so that you know this thing exists within 3D space. Mm -hmm. But then later, like when you're being more illusionistic, you can have something that's you know there's a shadow, but it's not attached to a thing, which denotes that it's floating in space right. or that you're it's playing a trick on your eyes somehow. And then later on, I guess like when you get even more abstract, then there is no shadow because you know the plane is flat. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at even like for instance Monet's like lily pads, you realize that the field of vision is really flat. There's no foreground, midground, and mm -hmm. background, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just variation 
variations in color ever so slight to denote a change between like a lily and the lily pad and the pond that it's on. Mm -hmm. So then I wonder too, it's like, I, I feel like even unconsciously or maybe consciously, like um, when artists are painting that they also think about these things that like mm -hmm. very meticulous changes. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Definitely. Like, uh, I showed you some VR experiments that I yeah, had. Yeah. I wonder if you have noticed any shadows in that. No, there's no shadows. Exactly. So that's like, that's intentionally done because yeah. I used like a uniform light right. without any casting shadows right. on it. And which like to some people might seem a little weird, uh -huh. but then I didn't find it to be weird because we want to, we don't want the shadow to affect depth or distance perception in our experiments uh -huh. that's why i got rid of it but then uh -huh. as soon as like i threw in the shadows like it, it, uh, the realism kind of like got boosted up a little bit right right so in that sense it's more about capturing the physics mm -hmm. that's being underlying through our entire life uh -huh. that it just like kind of captures a bit back in the computer simulation right that made us think that oh it's uh, more similar to what I have seen uh -huh. uh, since I was born, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, like, say you put an infant, like, it's not ethical, of course, but if you put an infant through this kind of environment when the infant was just born, uh -huh. right, would, would this infant find it weird after he or she grows up later, like, in a world that without shadows, and then suddenly being put back into what we call the real world, Right, that has shadows. Like, would it be weird to that person? Right? Is it like a is a you know, like a learned thing that's being that's a good question picked up? Right? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, there. I mean, there's a whole well, not not a whole field, but there are people that research this. There is a guy that uh, named Pavan Sinha, and it, this is really cool. So he has uh, he goes to India where there are lots of children who don't get uh, cataract surgery. So cataracts mm -hmm. cloud your eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they can't afford it. Right. It's not, there's nothing like difficult about the surgery, they just can't afford it. So they grow up blind. And then he pays for the, he finds these kids and then he pays for their surgery and then he measures their vision after it's restored, mm -hmm. after they remove the cataracts. And he notes sort of like, what is it like for them to see the world? Because mm -hmm. they've gone from being blind mm -hmm. completely throughout their entire development to being able to see all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And it would be curious to see whether or not they have any idea of what shadows are. Right. Uh, or whether or not they're like, why there are dark spots everywhere. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. Right. Because yeah. uh, it reminds me of a movie. I forgot what it's called. But it's a documentary about an old couple. They, uh, they've they been born deaf. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. Right. And then they got a cochlear implant towards the like the later stages of their lives like 50s or 60s wow and you know to us all the ambient sound is just taken for granted so we can like direct our attentions mm -hmm. to the sound that we want to pay attention to mm -hmm. but for them everything is just so noisy they cannot filter out the ambient sound mm -hmm. so that like Mm -hmm. They'll get stressed out. That's mm -hmm. really disorienting. Right. So they would just take off their cochlear implant because they didn't like it. Right. right? It's just too much to handle. Yeah. And then, uh, so I, I think it's probably like a, along a similar line of ideas. But if you if we bring back that bring that idea back to ours, I think yeah. it's from artists trying to break this kind of associations mm -hmm. or whatnot that we've been developed through our entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, we, when we look at a piece of painting, that well, that piece of painting looks weird, right? And then, uh, but then you just make you start thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Because to me, like arts, arts has a role that motivates people to think, mm -hmm. think about like their lives, like what they take for granted. So, like in terms of those kind of arts, like if it makes you think, I think that would that's nice. Right? It's just like the artist might have accomplished something that he or she always wanted to accomplish. But, but that we might not ever know that what the what's the true intention mm -hmm. behind what the artists do in their, their work. I think a lot of like us us speaking as an artist mm -hmm. will try to like offer the world through a different pair of eyes mm -hmm. and a different perspective essentially. And I um, when Cheyenne you were talking about kind of like the lower vision. Um, and also about how it's like seeing things differently mm -hmm. too. Um, I thought about how one of the, there's an artist and she uh, became blind later in her life, but then she paints with clay to have 3D relief. 
and she paints with color but then the colors obviously don't reflect the colors in real life but she knows what they are but then she would do portraits for instance in neon magenta yeah. and then someone would be like why is you know this uh -huh. person why are they in magenta and she's like you know for me i can't see so when i get to know someone i just feel the energy around them mm -hmm. and the color that it translates to me is this magenta color mm -hmm. that so-and-so gives me. Right. And so isn't, isn't it different how we experience the world if, I guess, one of our senses is lost? Or I guess for you guys too, like, do you guys try to um, kind of look at the world through different ways of perceiving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's uh, I think it's uh, like they call it like uh, multi-sensory integration or whatnot. But it's just uh, I, I'm not too familiar with that subject matter. <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then to me, I, I. yeah, I think every every single aspect of our senses should all converge to a single universe, a single environment mm -hmm. in which we live and we breathe, mm. and then. Right, uh, like our hearings and color, like vision, and our taste, our smell, everything always comes together. If it's in real life, uh -huh. and then like we we're talking about virtual reality again, like we break that chain, mm -hmm. break that link. Like when we see like a like a big plate of a real chicken, we don't smell chicken in virtual reality. It might look as real as it could be, but we don't smell it. And then that that's weird. Like once we have everything, and then we just take away one thing, then uh, then we don't have that reality anymore. Yeah. Where what is reality in that sense, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and and <laughs> we get sick if it doesn't line up, right? Right. Yeah. 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 The misalignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, misalignment uh, makes you sick. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. I mean, also probably makes you very, I don't know, sick and just. You probably want to stop doing whatever you're doing, right? Actually, yeah. when I walked into, well, when I was wearing the VR headset and I was experiencing that room that mm -hmm. had no shadows, mm -hmm. I didn't realize until you mentioned it that I had no shadows. But one of the first things I said is like, it feels like you're in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And it's quite meditative because it's basically white walls all around mm -hmm. you. And there's no, like, I guess, sense of where you are in your positionality right. in regards to it because mm -hmm. I guess there's no shadow. Right. Um, but it was actually quite meditative in mm -hmm. a sense because it feels like you're, you know, taken out of a space mm -hmm. and then like you were dropped mm -hmm. in somehow. Right. Like right. Yeah. Um, so in that environment that you were in, uh -huh. like you also did not have your body. Right, exactly. Like, I if couldn't you, see myself. Right. So yeah. if you're looking at yourself now, I see my legs, I see my torso, I see my arms, I see my hands. Right, but in that environment, you don't have any of those. Right. So you're essentially just like a flying pair of eyes. <laughs> just, you know, just flying around in the void. Yeah. And then you don't have anything. Yeah. And, right, so, which could be meditative. Like, it's kind of like an out-of-body experience. It is. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it could also be a sickening. Like, some people <laughs> get motion sickness from that kind of environment too, <laughs> because uh, they don't, like, this lack of uh, information in there right. right true yeah and then like so i guess a lot of the projects that you guys work on they take all these different aspects like would you consider i guess more like philosophical aspects um to inform like projects that you're doing now or like art related um are there like i guess overlaps between um the technical like the technology aspect with art mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm going to mention the, the exhibit I saw. So at, at MOCA, what was it? <laughs> Museum of Contemporary Canadian Art? Yes. Is that, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I want to find the information on this. But there was a video like running on loop in one of these areas where what the guy, or I don't know if it was a man or a woman, but the person had done is taken computer vision algorithms and taken an image of something, fed it into the algorithm, and then take in the representation of various points throughout the algorithm and show an image of that. So what these algorithms do is they take an image and then they transform it somehow. They um, either look for edges or they look for certain objects in the scene. And those can be recreated into images that you can view that sort of represent what it's thinking about or what it's extracting or what it's looking at. 
and it was really cool as just a purely as, as someone who uses these algorithms to see them turn into art to see this thing that's very cold calculating sort of doesn't care about anyone or anything it's just a bunch of numbers in a computer and then taking its brain and sp spitting it out onto mm -hmm. a screen and then you can see it sees the world in a very different way mm -hmm. than we think at least we see the world we don't really know how we see the world but it was just it the alienness of it really got to me and i thought about it like if these things are really working like this do they really work like we do mm -hmm. um and if they do, do we really have any sort of sense of how we work? Right? Mm -hmm. We think we know how we come to decisions. Mm -hmm. We think we know how we come to conclusions. Um, but maybe it's not at all what we think. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a lot of research on this in psychology. But from a purely visual perspective, it was really, it was very eye-opening to just see everything that, that we just, we don't even look at these things, right? If you're using a deep learning algorithm, mm -hmm. you just give it an input and you take the output. Yeah, you don't you don't care about what happens in the middle, but this guy had laid it all open, so it was really cool to see. That's what's wrong with deep learning. Yeah, I know, like well, that's what I'm trying to do, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, trying to get it open because pe people have been taking the deep learning as a black box. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like as long as the the black box accomplish where they want to accomplish, it's all good, uh -huh. right? But nobody's like looking into that, like how did it do what they do? The process. Yes, okay. the process. Hey, just, I'm looking at that. Great. So, yeah, so please uh, share us with yeah. your findings. <laughs> uh, uh, we don't need to talk about the details of the research. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and it's, it's extremely convoluted, the process. I, Literally I, convoluted. Uh, yes, because with all those many layers, and then, uh, like, if you just do a lesion of one single neuron, like, neuron as in, like, just mm. one cell, right? Mm. It either yeah. fires or not, and then it will disrupt the entire network. Yeah, outcomes. you can't predict what it's going to do. Right, right. So it's like a chaos system. Like a, like the butterfly effect. <laughs> well, <laughs> but that's not how the brain works. In the brain, right. if you kill a neuron, nothing happens. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, you're true. Yeah. Right, like the Phineas Gage, like he got his entire frontal lobe pierced yeah. through, and then uh, he still functions well. At, although he might ended up being like a, like a. He was a gambling. Yeah, alcohol yeah. yeah, addict, yeah. Like, yeah, but yeah. but he lived, and then yeah, it's, but, that's crazy. Yeah, but if you if you kill like a single neuron in a deep neural network, and then a. Uh, I think it's just been wacky. Well, you don't know. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So, yeah. So yeah, it sort of depends. So it's like the plasticity is really fun. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So that exhibit, did it actually show the process of this? Like, what did it look like visually? So it looked like a, a video where you could see, they, they, show, they would like flash tons of images that had been used, I think, to train these networks. But you didn't see the images themselves, you saw altered versions of them. So when you feed one of these images into a neural network, it, look, it has sort of like versions of the image throughout the pipeline, but these versions look very different than uh, what the image itself look like, looks okay. like. So they might highlight, for example, where arms are in an image of people, right? So it would flash an image of a person, but their arms would be super bright or something like that. Or it might uh, look only at motion, right, in a video. So you would see uh, a car, but only while it's moving. And if it stopped, it would disappear or something like that. So it was just a rapid fire presentation of these weird, distorted looking images, which if you just looked at it, you'd be like, oh, this is, you know, something abstract. Um, there's no real meaning to it, but actually these are literally what's going on in the mind of a computer vision algorithm. And then what algorithm are they being fed? Are I don't know. They didn't say which particular algorithm they were using, but it was some some machine learning pipeline. Um, or like Relu or something. Yeah, it's probably like yeah. one of these standard neural networks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's really interesting because I go to a lot of exhibits now where they feature like digital futures or yeah. like fusing art with technology and yeah. then but then I don't understand the I guess algorithm part of it yeah. so then when I read something like that I wonder um so what's actually happening here and like yeah, yeah like what's I would like to know yeah more detail <laughs> but uh, I guess he probably or he or she probably wants to not overwhelm the viewer with technical details. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm sure like we could probably email this person and ask them. I, mm -hmm. I don't remember what it was yeah. called. It was part of a larger exhibit on uh, our lives online, basically, what it's like 
mm-hmm. to be a human now that mm-hmm. so much of your life is communicated through the internet. Mm-hmm. And through right. And yet, like, you're, you're asking this kind of questions, but the mo- majority of us aren't even aware of the things that exist, right? Mm-hmm. Like, when they're all talking about data privacy, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not sharing my location data, like, they don't even understand, like, the background behind all of those, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's not a single person that's capable of looking through all those single data points right. with the massive amount of smartphones and all those like, constantly uploading data to the cloud. Right. But then it's the computer that's behind all of those. And then, and then everybody just becomes a single data point, essentially, that characterizes this zygist. And that's like, that, you know, it's kind of pathetic mm-hmm. to some extent that our, and our entire existence became our smartphones and the data is associated with the smartphones. Mm-hmm. They don't really care about who's behind the smartphone. Right. They just care about what you're going to get from Amazon, right? Yeah. And then, which is, I think, is what people should start to think about and, and also think about whether they want that in their lives, whether they want to be reduced to a single data point. Mm-hmm. Right. Identity. Yeah. yeah. It's a... I don't know how much control we have over that. Right. But it's good to, you need to know, right? Right. You need to know what's going on. Yeah. At least, at least to be aware of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I think it, you know, high schools and colleges should teach their students how basic, you know, the technology that they interact with works. Maybe not the details of the algorithms that it works, but the actual consequences, the data, what data is being collected, what's being done with it. Um, yeah, the sort of things you're talking yeah. about. Because people don't, they just have no idea mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how much of their private life is not private. Right, right. Well, you might find it creepy that, like, you've talked to your friends about buying, like, let's say, a sleeping bag, and then all of a sudden, like, five minutes later, when you go onto <laughs> Facebook, and then a sleeping bag pops up. It's like, yeah. you'll be like, what happened? Like, yeah. How do they know? Yeah. You know, but, but that's as much as it goes, right? But how, where did they get the data from? Mm-hmm. Uh, how they processed it yeah. like why how they targeted you through mm-hmm. your Facebook account yeah. do they know who you are mm-hmm. right and stuff yeah. like that but I'm curious too because yeah. like I guess um, it would be cool for for instance artists who are very interested in exploring issues of identity privacy what does it mean in this era with mm-hmm. like you know all these information around us to actually work with like a scientist mm-hmm. to like kind of explore these mm-hmm. and kind of have a collaboration that come out of this like this is something that i can think of just mm-hmm. hearing this discussion from mm-hmm. you guys but then from your side like are there collaborations that you can think of that join kind of arts and um, tech or science in a good way or things that you've worked on and thought, huh, it'd be cool to have the other perspective. So that, uh, let's see, I know people have done these collaborations, obviously, and actually York, the Vista has a, has a, um, has mm-hmm. an artist, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Right, so right, they're, yes. they explicitly in Vista, the program that we're both part of, mm-hmm put money into integrating art with mm-hmm. vision research. I don't know how successful it's been, mm-hmm. but... And then at yeah. MIT, too, did you? Because I think it was one of the first institutions that had artists in residence. Oh, okay. Yeah, in the science departments. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it was. There, it was, like, groundbreaking. This oh. was, like, uh, not that long ago, actually, okay. sadly. It but, may have been uh, since I left. Yeah, yeah. For, no, 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 not that recent, oh, okay. but <laughs> it, it has been a long time. Okay. I don't know how it is these days anymore, so, yeah. yeah. But, they, they, I haven't... They they definitely do install a lot of art there, okay. <laughs> but I yeah. and, and it is sort of based loosely on the science. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the extent of it though. Uh-huh. But this thing that I was talking about, the mocha, was really cool. Like mm-hmm. I wish I had thought of that. Right. Yeah. 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 I think I, I think it also goes back to how you would define art. What is art for? Uh-huh. Right. Like to me, art is for mass consumption. Uh-huh. Like the same thing with uh, like uh, during the Middle Ages where they paint those outer pieces on um, um, like in a church, right? To uh, teach people about the stories in the Bibles because mm-hmm. most, people, most people cannot read. Mm-hmm. And then so they want to use those art from those most visceral, like in the simplest format mm-hmm. to convey a certain ideas. I, I think like currently art is still kind of has that, uh, still has that uh, capability. So. And, and then, so I think from a scientist's perspective, what, 
what I would like the, in terms of the art collaboration is to to kind of have artists help us to translate mm -hmm. this kind of hard to understand those like science ideas mm -hmm. into the most straightforward forms mm -hmm. that can evoke this kind of visceral uh, feelings mm -hmm. in its viewers mm -hmm. and to motivate people to start to think about their lives mm -hmm. and what they do in their lives and this is the current time mm -hmm. that they're in mm -hmm. and then hopefully that can make a difference in their lives in exchange as well mm -hmm. and then uh, it's just kind of this continuation of this findings to to the mass I'd be interested in seeing, for instance, if we took that project one step further, mm -hmm. because it sounds like um, using art to communicate understanding and kind of outreach to greater audience, mm -hmm. right, for science mm -hmm. um, purposes. And I think that there's a lot where uh, art um, uses tech as a medium to, you know, do certain things, or, yeah. you know, science uses art as a medium to mm -hmm. outreach greater audiences. But what about if there's do you think that there's room for two-way contribution mm -hmm. um, where in a way to art contributes to the scientific research and what could art bring to the table here um, mm. so just from a purely technical perspective mm -hmm. um, in order to create digital art you need to have a way of interacting with a computer that's intuitive mm -hmm. right um, you need to for example, um, you know, whatever Photoshop's content to wear fill or something like that. Um, art requires improvement of science. It requires discoveries. It requires um, developments in technology to be able to push the boundaries, right? So that's sort of the boring answer. Uh, I'm trying to think of like how can art actually help us either do science or get inspired to do science. Mm -hmm. And then what could be like this kind of two-way contribution where each yeah. contributes to each other. Yeah. But then I think this is also a pretty broad mm -hmm. question. Right. I think it maybe it needs to be taken to like case-specific um, project. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess are there ways that like whether how you visualize or think about things have been um, informed by, I guess, something of like an artistic process for instance like i know even just very um like friends who are scientists that they say they go to like look at an exhibit and then something about you know the perspective of painting or a sculpture or installation that makes them think of in other ways mm -hmm. um but then i'm i guess i'm just curious in general mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think the power of art to change your perspective in both, you know, a literal and also a figurative way mm -hmm. can help, you know, boost creativity in science yeah. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough talks, like, mm -hmm. I think in general, not even arts and science, but all, every single field, every single field, like, at least to me, it's really isolated. Mm -hmm. That's just like, to some extent, I feel like people just don't like interdisciplinary collaborations. <laughs> and then, if you look at you, if you look at the different uh -huh. literatures on a similar topic, people use different terminologies to describe the same phenomena, which became a huge barrier of entry mm -hmm. for people who wanted to commence this kind of interdisciplinary collaborations. Right. So, which is like. If people can just pull their all all their effort together, mm -hmm. and then it might just create something that's just truly astonishing, and super creative, and and then uh, yeah, yeah, and I like a lot of vision labs that I go to like to have art on the walls, and part of that is to inspire you to like think about what did this artist have to go through to get this to look like this right wow. and if they had to go through all of that all those specific things they had to do how are we are we taking those into account when we try to understand how human vision works mm -hmm. you know with a single stroke of your brush uh, you can make something that looks like like a tree or a mountain or a person's arm or a ripple or something and that just knowing that it's a stroke is not enough, right? And that's, for example, an important thing in vision is that context matters a lot. And I think artists are really good at showing us these things that we might not have thought of uh, originally. Mm. And I think I would be really interested in learning more about 
your processes, mm -hmm. like you know how you think, how you perceive, how you um, visualize things, um, because I think that's what I think a lot when I'm um, doing my art practice. Um, and then I feel like there could be a lot of similarities there, but it could also offer a lot of new perspectives. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's just not enough conversations. Like I think just uh, you know just have a bunch of people from different backgrounds just hang out at a bar and you know, That'd be nice, yeah. like, talk about what to do and then yeah. 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 sort of over yeah, yeah exactly yeah, 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 courtesy exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah whenever uh, COVID is done we'll sit in a bar and, okay. yeah. uh, or whenever you figure out how to make Zoom just like real life <laughs> yeah and then we'll yeah. all sit in a Zoom so, bar right, it sounds good I would still prefer an actual bar than yeah for bar. sure <laughs> great okay well it's set and I think this is a good note to okay. Okay. So, okay. Thank Thanks. you both so much. Thanks for thank you. It's Great really discussion. interesting. Yeah. I feel like there's so much that can be unraveled mm -hmm. further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for this episode of Beyond Codes and Aesthetics. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Also, please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. Beyond Codes and Aesthetics is produced by Kohei and Translations on Himalaya Podcasts by Will Jung. Take care and see you next time.